name is David Bateman and I'm one of the producers of Evo TV, Eco Village Organizing, a new show dedicated to documenting sustainable activism in our communities and showcasing the people, groups and organizations that are trying to make our communities more livable. As anyone who has recently gone to their grocery store has noticed, food prices are on the rise. Many say that this is due to our industrialized and globalized method of agricultural production that is so dependent on fossil fuels and so susceptible to increases in the cost of energy. They say that for every calorie we eat, 10 calories of oil is used in its production. Climate change and changing weather patterns are also starting to have an effect. And scientists say this is being mitigated by our burning of fossil fuels that puts increasing amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. So what can we do about it? Many people are saying that we have to move to a more localized method of growing our food. But how do we accomplish this in a dense urban environment like Metro Vancouver? Today I'm being joined by three people who are working on solutions to that very problem. Arzina Hamir is an agriologist and works for the, as coordinator for the Richmond Food Security Society, a nonprofit group that promotes local food production and consumption. She earned her bachelor's degree in crop science from the University of Guelph and her master's degree in sustainable agriculture from the University of London, England. Arzina worked for Ibarra abroad for many years as a CUSO volunteer in Thailand and as a researcher in Jamaica, India and Bangladesh. She was the staff agriologist for West Coast Seeds in the late 90s and ran her own seed company, Terra Viva Organics. Arzina also sits on the board of the Richmond Fruit Tree, Society, Fruit Tree Sharing Project, the Richmond Schoolyard Society, and the BC Food Systems Network, in conjunction with Kwantlen University. Arzina helped to launch the Richmond Farm School and teaches market crop production there. Next to her is David Tracy. He is a writer and designer at specializing in community ecology. His design firm, Eco Urbanist, provides environmental site design and cons consultation to private community-based and uh, government clients. His, rep his reports for media around the world focus on the corrections, connections between politics, culture, and the environment. He is the author of the recently published Urban Agriculture Ideas and Designs for the New Food Revolution. He has also written Guerrilla Gardening, a manifesto, and the comedy The Miracle Tree. A certified arborist, he is the executive director of Tree City, a nonprofit group helping people and trees grow together. Next to him is Tricia Sedgwick. She is a registered holistic nutritionist with a background in environmental studies. In 2007, she spearheaded the World in the Garden, an urban agriculture product designed to enable youth and community to experience the cultural, nutritional, and environmental benefits of local organic food systems and from seed to table. Her global vision is to build ag gardens and connect agriculture around the world through food. Uniting Thread, Tricia is also the founder of Seeds of Plenty, the <coughs> sprouted cookie company which offers organic artesian cookies, treats, and ethical gift baskets. Seeds of Plenty is built on an ethical business practices and a fundraising model that gives back to the world in a garden. Her website is www.seedsofplenty.com and theworldinthegarden.com. Well, it's interesting you mentioned uh, sod and lawns, you know, people putting such a, a big emphasis on that and they want these perfect lawns, they use all mm -hmm. these chemicals on it. I mean, you know, you can't really eat lawns. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's just nuts. So that was, that, that's good. I mean, so what's that website again, David? Fooddemocracy.org. And what other uh, things can citizens mm -hmm. and our viewers do in terms of, you know, sort of getting, prodding our governments to, to, to take a, a better stand on the issue of, of, of urban agriculture? Mm -hmm. I think education's a big piece of it. Um, even now with the big movement in Vancouver with backyard chickens and growing grains on front lawns, there's a lot of citizens who aren't very happy about it. Even when we put the garden in front of City mm -hmm. Hall, there was a lot of people in Vancouver who thought that's going to be ugly and you know growing mm. food's not like just it's not aesthetically pleasing and one of the 
great things about our garden is we work to make it aesthetically pleasing and people walk by and they're always commenting on how beautiful it is. And it's the whole thing's almost 99% of it's edible. So I think a lot of what we can do is help to educate other people and mm. um, live by example by growing our own food and doing it in a nice, respectful manner so that you know the people who are concerned about aesthetics um, are appeased as well. And, and then also to be educated on the cultural benefits, on creating community and all the other benefits that come with growing food. So. I think we, gotta, we have to raise the, the, the status of the grower, of the farmer, really. I mean, you, yeah. you'd pay your doctor you know, millions of dollars for your health, but what would you pay your farmer? And at what status is your local foods, food provider? I mean, they're the ones that are really providing you with your health. Um, without them, you know, you would be at the doctor's office all the time. So um, I think we as a generation also need to educate. I, I find a lot of resistance actually in with older people who see cities and urban areas as, an, as a way of getting away from uh, country folk and the dirtiness of the country and farming. And they, they see that city people have a certain place and, and country people have a certain place and the two should not be meeting. And what I think what we're saying is, is that we need to blend th those two. Um, we need our food being um, grown closer to home. We need a stronger connection with that food. And our farmers need, we need to know our farmers. We need to know who they are and we need to support them um, because that's just the way, our, that's what we want to see our community grow towards. Uh, having, knowing your farmer, knowing where your food comes, how it's grown. So raising the status of your local farmer, I think, will help to maybe ease some of these yeah. um, strange, um, I guess, resistances that come up against food production. Yeah, I've noticed that too, and it's an yeah. odd thing, isn't it? And I, sometimes it seems generational, but then I know there's quite a few seniors who are yeah. totally into this. Oh thing, yeah, I wouldn't and there's say. There's some it. young, you know, yuppified couples yeah. who are like, I don't yeah. want that next door to me. Right. I want the beautiful right. lawn that I've envisioned all my life. It's an odd thing. I, I wonder <laughs> myself whether it's not um, a generation or two of um, some kind of collective memory that's carried on, because there was a time when. The farm was, you know, the bumpkins, they were looked down, farmers were kind of stupid, um, they were hay seeds, mm -hmm. they were unsophisticated, they had mud on their boots, and then the city people were the sophisticates, the smart ones, the, you know, the gentlemen and lady types, and there was definitely a sort of discrimination against just the farm types. Yeah. And somehow, even though that's almost, there's no bearing in reality in that anymore for people living in the city or in the farms, if you go to the rural areas now, that consciousness is somehow can carried through. So sometimes when we'll talk about bringing in a community yeah. garden where people will grow food, people will get this almost visceral <laughs> hate on for the fact of people <laughs> growing food. Oh my God, it's going to be terrible. Yeah. Our property values, got, give you carrots right here, and yeah. they get apoplectic. It's crazy. Yeah. But I think it is a, an education thing. Mm -hmm. And that's why for me, it's getting people themselves to grow some. As soon as you do that, you get a little more appreciation yeah. for you know how it's done, yeah. the science of it, but also the art of it and the miracle of it. To be able to plant a seed and see that grow into a yeah. sprout, and then eventually you tend it and you fondle it and yeah. do all the things you do with your plants, and then you get to eat it at the end, and it's it's like a blessed thing almost. Yeah. And then you go to the farmer's market and you talk to them about, hey, wh what happened with my potato and why is your potato different? And then you start looking at the supermarket food and you think, well, why do those Tomatoes not taste like tomatoes. What happened here? You know, I know. Why can you bounce is. them off the? Yeah. The <laughs> How come their skin's so hard and they, don't, they won't puncture? <laughs> they never <laughs> rot. <laughs> no. What? You can use them for a yeah. war effort. Not the <laughs> but maybe animals. maybe one thing we can do is. Uh, uh, right now, I know there's some resistance among school boards about having gardens at schools. Well, yeah. maybe we could provincial government, department of education yeah. mandate Absolutely. that every school have a garden where kids are taught how to grow food. And yeah. the thing is with kids is they're powerful. And I think a lot of the work we can do is with kids because they go home and they demand certain things and they want to do different things. And then the kids always, we always start the year off by them going home um, with a bean with the bean sprout in the new year and they go home and they grow it and we did one kid did a time lapse on it and they're showing their parents and their parents are coming out and then they're engaging on a different level mm -hmm. because it's some of those people who are, have some opposition to it who see it as a lowly 
as a lowly thing. So I think uh, kids are kids are definitely powerful. But I think you're right too. In not just having um, a garden as an ornamental thing f right. to show off to you right. know the community, um, embedding food production and growing food as a life skill in um, schools. Yeah. I think kids are growing up having no skill whatsoever, not only of how to grow food, but how to cook it. Yeah. I mean, that's why they're all going towards, you know, fast food, microwavable stuff that you just open the package and, and eat. They don't know how to cook anymore. So I, I think our, our education system certainly also needs to address this. So right. um, it's not just the Ministry of Ag, it's the Ministry of Education, of Health, Everyone needs to take a look at our food system and see what's what part that they can play in, in helping to turn it around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at present we seem to look at our urban environment in terms of being real estate, uh, nothing to be bought and sold. And, uh, you know, we don't seem to see it as, you know, part of our environment. Uh, how can we how can we change uh, change things from where we look at it just being about money to sort of looking at what I think we were describing mm -hmm. as sort of more of a holistic approach where we are part of this environment and it you know we have to live within the the constraints and live within this environment rather than always trying to get the environment to conform to our vision of it. I think yeah. the environment. Oh yeah, go ahead. After you. No, go go go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I think you're right about it's a different approach to what the environment is and can be. And we are pretty much obsessed with the real estate view of it. Um, what does that cost? Can you, you know, oh, it's gone up 4%. No, it's going to go down. And it's a way to look at land as a commodity, which is kind of crazy because it's not. It's something that nourishes us, that we live on, even if for a limited <coughs> time that our kids are going to live on or our grandkids. The land endures, so it's how we use it that's mm -hmm. more important than who owns it and what they're using it for. Um, but in terms of changing that consciousness, I think the land use is something that policy can come into it. Mm -hmm. So for, mm -hmm. like now we have public parks, so we agreed when we made cities that we had to have some antidote to the industrialization and the crowded because cities were seen as dirty and pestilent and places where you went to the factory to work and lived in a hovel and just did the industry part of it, but not really healthy places. The farm back then was still the healthy place. So as the antidote to that, we made public parks. And that was a place for people to get respite, a little bit of nature, a little bit of breathing space. The air was rumored to be better in the parks than it was around the rest of the city. And that was a good thing. Now in our parks, we have playgrounds. It's almost most parks of a decent size, you'll have a small playground for little kids. So we've kind of agreed as a society that uh, you know, kids up to knee high deserve a space for a slide and a teeter totter and whatever they are now. Now it's a big plastic <laughs> conglomerate <laughs> thing that I don't know if they don't get bored with it <laughs> a, a couple of times or not. But they're there, and anyway, it's okay. It's good. We all kind of agree that's an important thing for little kids. But why can't we also agree that food is important for not just the little kids, I mean, definitely for them, but also for everybody? Mm -hmm. So why can't our parks include edible landscaping? include more places where people can see, come in contact with, appreciate the aesthetic and practical appeal of, on a daily basis, food as it's grown in our cities. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that we can do with policy, and that gets mm -hmm. you know, us telling our elected officials that this is what we demand. Mm -hmm. So uh, we touched on it briefly, but how would you assess our present day diet, that the foods that people are eating? Well, I, I guess the right? <laughs> you're the, yeah, you're the nutritionist, I think, I think Trisha, it, so maybe this should be one for you. I don't want to be too harsh here. I really think it depends um, who we're talking about. But I think if we're talking about the average um, sad diet, it's it's um, the standard American diet. Um, it's it's pretty sad, literally. So people are eating um, boxed, packaged, um, really refined foods, and people are obese and basically what we would say they're undernourished and overfed so they're the weights there but they actually don't have the nutrients that they need to be living a healthy life and yeah I mean I can't say much more than that and mm -hmm. it's, it's it's bad and and with that um, when people don't understand where their food comes from or they just go to the grocery store there's a huge disconnect between the land that their food is grown from and the and 
their health and their nutrition and how, how their body is connected to the land that we live off of and the food that it that comes from it. So, I mean, people, they have no idea that flour comes from a grain that comes from grass and that you have to harvest that grass and then take the grain out and, you know, mill it and all those. We do that with the kids as well. And so they're learning like, oh, this is what flour is. You know, this is what we put in cookies. This is what we put in muffins. and. Um, I think if people had more education around where their food was coming from, that they would think more about their health. Because right now, for um, the average person shopping at Costco or Safeway and buying these, these big boxes and packages of food, they, they don't know. They have, they have no connection to where it's coming from. And, you know, to looking at the holistic approach, too, I mean, you know, one of the big crises we, we're, we're facing is, is the healthcare crisis. I mean, we can't afford, you know, our healthcare system can't afford to deal with the sickness we see with our society right. and it seems one of the ways you know one of the easiest ways to sort of deal with a lot of our obesity and and and, and diabetes and all these other health problems mm. that we're facing is by putting more money into getting people to grow more of their own food because right. people don't really look on food as being it's a nutritional aspects of food mm -hmm. you know not the taste or the smell or anything else but actually what it does right. for your body and back to what david said um it's the problem is in the subsidies like we're what we're subsidizing is not locally grown food we're subsidizing genetically modified crops like corn and canola and soy and those if you look at any box or packaged food that's like the top three ingredients that are going to be in there it's either going to be corn canola and soy and I mean, almost 199% of that is genetically modified. So, yeah, it's it's where we're putting it's where we're putting our money, at, where our government's putting the money, and these big companies like Monsanto, these um, they have a lot more money than the government usually. So that they're saying what goes. Or they own yeah. the government. Yeah, or they own, they pretty much own the government. So yeah, it's it's, it's a big problem. Um, I think that growing um, when we're going back to the whole education piece, you know, working with people to educate them on what is healthy and what green food really is mm -hmm. and that it can taste good. And we did a taste test the other day in front of Green's Organic Grocery Store and um, we made kale chips for everyone. So they're like chips, but they're actually made out of kale, which is very high in calcium. It's one of the most absorbable forms of calcium there is. And people were saying, what's kale? What, what is this? And just um, you know, getting all these different reactions, and people were enjoying it and liking it. And where can I buy it? And but it's it's about education. You got to get out there and get people growing and learning about their food. It's probably one of the easiest greens to grow as well. Yeah, so it grows year round. It's completely local. Yeah. It's as local as it gets. Yeah. I mean, sometimes um, at West Coast Seeds, they've had a kale plant for 13 years apparently. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and I know what you mean. I mean, once you've eaten a, 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 a strawberry from Richmond, I, I cannot eat California strawberry no, anymore because it's, I mean, it's not, not really a strawberry. It's, yeah. and, and you touched on genetically modified food, and I mean, really, we still don't know what the long-term health hazards of, of genetically modified food yeah. is. Yeah, and I, every year I go to you know a few different farms. Um, I usually do local farm tours for the Chess Association, and I've sometimes we'll go to a conventional farm, and I was talking to one farmer who said, you know, People are just scared of genetically modified foods because they don't know what it is. And I said, well, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> the problem. <laughs> I don't want to be someone's guinea pig because I don't know what genetically modified food is. It's a, I mean, I understand how it's done and I understand, and I don't agree with how it's done. I don't agree with putting an unrelated um, gene in, into um, the gene sequence of something else. Of, so, you know, fish hormones or fish into tomatoes. I don't agree with that and I don't know what the long-term effects are and yeah part of the problem is, is that we don't know what it is you know and, and it's been it hasn't been around long enough to just say yeah I think their tagline Monsanto's tagline is something like feeding the world or something like that and we don't know that it can feed the world and it doesn't seem like a very good way to feed the world you know on a social level or a cultural level. Well. So what can our viewers do? What what suggestions would uh, would you have for our viewers that they they can take uh, take to heart and act on to, you know, work with you to make our, our, our community a more livable place, a healthier place for us, our children, and our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Marzina? Oh, where to start? I think probably one of the easiest steps to take is to eat at home more and to eat real food. So cook, 
eat at home, eat with your family, um, make food a celebratory thing, as Trish was saying. Trish was saying, um, enjoy your food, um, learn the tastes of food. And once you learn to appreciate what real food tastes like, then you can start taking the next steps of maybe buying from your local farmer's market or mm -hmm. getting to know a local farmer or even growing a little bit of that yourself. But maybe one of the easiest steps to take is at least once a week, cook at home and eat with your family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd second that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go eat with your friends. Okay. <laughs> Come on over. No, I think it's a great idea. Um, I have a little bit of a problem um, telling people what to eat. Uh, I don't have a problem. I do it all the time. But I, <laughs> I get used to them not listening to me because I have two kids, and they don't. You know, but I'll, you know, I'll say, eat your vegetables, and one will and one won't. So, but, uh, but I'm still a little bit reluctant to say you should do this or shouldn't do that, and this is the diet you should do. Even though, when I wrote the latest book I did, I said we should have two kinds of designations for the stuff that we're buying in the supermarkets, and one would be food, F-O-O-D, and the other one should be a different spelling of that same word, the kind of way that they have cheese whiz, and they can't spell cheese, C-H-E-E-S-E, -E -E, because it's not really cheese, and <laughs> it's probably petroleum products, and there's no cow ever got near that thing. So we should call that food, F-U-D, with a little umlaut or something. <laughs> over the U, I so like that. We distinguish those two. But one thing I, I will uh, counsel for advice is that um, see how you feel after you eat real food as compared to, you know, the kind of crap we're all used to eating a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Because I find myself, and I do, I eat crap, you know, it's, it's cheap, it's fast, I'm in a hurry, I'll do it like the way we're not supposed to do, standing over the sink, wolfing something down to another meeting, <laughs> um, some kind of a processed, manufactured thing with ingredients longer than my leg. David, it's you're horrifying to stuff. That. <laughs> you're going to edit this out, so that's okay. <laughs> uh, but see how you feel after, because for me, that's a real yeah. um, direct lesson. Not how you feel when you're eating it, because it feels good when you eat fat, when you eat Salt stuff. You know, and immediately sugar. it's like, oh, good. It's Big Mac, you feel yeah. great. Yeah. But half an hour later, you know, compare the two. How do you feel? Because there, there are people who go through their entire lives with a headache, or they feel bloated, or they're sluggish, yeah. or whatever, and yet they still keep eating the same fuel that's maybe yeah. putting them in this state. Whereas if they do have a home meal with friends and family and loved ones of real food, cooked appropriately and all that, I tend to feel really good after that half an hour yes. later. And I, you know, I just have to remind myself, yes, this is the way I want to eat, this is the way I want to share my food system with my family. Right. Oh, that's good. I, I'm, I'm down the same road as both of them. I think it's, you know, first, first thing is that it's going to take a little bit of effort. So don't think that mm -hmm. you're going to make any changes without making effort. Like as a nutritionist, pe my clients always say to me, well, I want, I want fast, quick, easy results. And I say, well, that's fine, but you still need to put some effort in. Like you can't create change without putting a little bit of effort. So. I mean, it, it can definitely be cooking at home, or it could be a, a quick t trip to the farmer's market. Like, just make a different, to make an effort to make some, a different routine or a different habit or whatever mm -hmm. it might be that you adapt. Whatever one calls to you, whether it's cooking at home or, you know, going to a friend's house who cooks well and can teach you some stuff, whatever it might be, um, I think is, is good. And right along the lines with what David and Arzina were saying, it's, you know, make, make the effort to eat at home and... Um, eat some eat some local food if you can. But I mean, even go visit a farm. I mean, it's it's a good thing to do with the family, and you um, the farmers are often have some very interesting things to talk about. And you know, just to make sure it's not a big factory farm, but <laughs> 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 go to a local farm. I mean, those pe those people um, they should be cherished. So the, they're making the world a better place, and they're literally feeding us. So we should really honor them and respect them. And I, you know, some of the most interesting, um, thoughtful, and uh, intelligent people have been the farmers I've met, you know, so. I hear that. Mm -hmm. It's true. And sometimes, you know, sometimes our, our situation, you know, you, you watch the news and it also seems home, hopeless. There's so much doom and gloom mm -hmm. out, out there. What inspires you people to keep doing the work mm -hmm. that yeah. you do so well? It, it's, I think it just continues to be self-inspiring. I mean, once you, um, for me, I've been in the doom and gloom part, and once I decided, you know what, I just want to make a difference. I, I don't want to be focused on, you know, all the awful things that are happening in the world, and I'm going to do something to create change. And when I started the garden, and you start meeting people like David and Arzina, and 
um, all the great people that are doing good work and really care. It's it, that's inspiring. And every time I go to the garden, I'm inspired. Every time I someone tells me, "Hey, I love the work that you're doing." Like the other day, we were pulling up the boulevard. We're building a native edible garden. Um, at our site right now and we were pulling up the boulevard and people are driving by saying thank you and you know I mean they're happy they're happy to see that we're turning grass into something a little bit nicer so I think it's I think it's about just taking the next step creating um, what it is you want to see in the world instead of focusing on what you don't want to see and it starts to create its own momentum and that momentum's inspiring mm -hmm. so I see it yeah, I think so too. I um, understand well the doom and gloom side of it, and it's really easy to fall into that. I do sometimes when I look <laughs> at the numbers and add them up and what's uh, against us. Yeah. And I just think, wow, we really are screwed here. This is going to be horrible, you know. But then I think I get inspiration from it's almost two things. One, it's it's a bit of altruism. I do want to make a better world and you know help people and help the future generations. But it's also selfish at the same time. Uh, I like myself better when I'm involved in things that are making a better world and yeah. doing something. So I actually have a better day when I've done something. I feel like even though it was hard or I worked hard or it didn't all work out, but I am making a small bit of difference. I feel better about me. I sleep better. I eat better. I'm just, you know, I like myself better when I'm in those situations. There's that. And also I get to meet really great people, the kind of people that I admire, that are my heroes, that I think, wow, you're just amazing. And um, they're the inspiration for me yeah. to do, and I always feel like I'm a bit of a slacker and a slouch when I get to <laughs> especially <laughs> talking to people like Azina and Trisha, who are always doing so many amazing things. And I just think, geez, I could have done one half of that and I'd be, be exhausted, you know? But that's the inspiration I get to keep going because. Um, as bad as it seems sometimes, as uh, stacked against us it seems with the folks with money, with the big corporations, with the media that seem to be blind to the whole thing, um, there are a lot of really good, dedicated, smart, yeah. intelligent, funny, amazing people. And if you want to hang with those kind of people and feel better about you and the world, um, you know, look them up. Get, Get dirty. <laughs> Get dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think when you're involved with growing food, even if you're not a religious person, you have to be a person of faith, of optimism, because you plant in that seed and you just hope for the best. And I think uh, you have to kind of put that type of view into the, all the work that you do. You, you just try, you make the effort, and hopefully it all turns out right. Well, thank you for coming up and uh, sharing your knowledge with us. And, uh, Please keep up your good work and realize that it is.